Um, okay, so welcome to the first session of the second day. This is the Energy Aware Systems session. We have three really fantastic papers for you. Um, the first one is being presented by Henry Hoffman from the University of Chicago. And so I'll leave the stage and let him tell you about his work on Jewel Guard. All right, thank you for the uh, introduction. So um, I'm gonna tell you about Jewel Guard. Uh, but I also wanted to thank my sponsors who are listed at the bottom of the slide. And very importantly, I'd like to thank my uh, sister. So three weeks ago, I had a knee surgery and um, I'm pretty much immobilized. And I actually had to take a train here instead of a plane. Uh, but uh, my sister was willing to make the, the trip from Chicago with me on the train uh, and I couldn't have done it without her. So I really appreciate that help. Uh, so let me get started with the, uh, the technical content. I think it's no surprise to anybody in this room that modern systems are constrained by energy consumption. I think it's kind of interesting that this is coming with pressure both from above and below sort of the computer systems level, right? So from above, we have users who want to have a long battery life on their mobile devices despite the rich set of features they want enabled. We also have users who would like to spend less money on electricity or at least control their cost. So that's kind of high level concerns that are pushing down on the system. And from below we have device level concerns. So we were relying pretty strongly on uh, Moore's law and Denard scaling to give us more transistors and uh, to keep the power consumption low as the transistor size scaled. But that seems to have run out of steam. So now we're building chips where we can put much more transistors down than we can actually power at full capacity all the time. So this has created a lot of pressure and it's resulted in sort of a rich uh, explosion of computer architectures lately. So we have systems that, uh, because of their energy constraints, have exposed trade-offs to software. So these trade-offs can take a lot of different forms, but in general, it's configurable resources. So it could be the number of cores that you use, the clock speed of those cores, cores of different types. So for example, heterogeneous cores on a single chip, um, or chips integrated with specialized accelerators. So figuring out how to manage all of this stuff is, is actually quite a difficult task, and that's increasingly becoming software's responsibility. So that's one uh, concern. The second concern is that we have these new application workloads, and many of them are amenable to approximation. So I think uh, a great example of this is media. So if you're watching a video, we might be able to add a little bit of noise uh, to the video in exchange for lowered resource consumption. That tends to be fairly uncontroversial. Uh, but there are lots of other applications that can benefit from this kind of trade-off. So financial analysis, for example, is processing huge amounts of data uh, all coming in as streams. And it turns out you can approximate some of the, the financial analysis equations and still get a pretty good result. You might get that result faster or in, in less energy. And the, the, the new huge cool thing, right, is big data. And the, the one interesting thing for me about big data is that, that often the data sets are so large that we can't compute the exact uh, result. Uh, it's just not tractable. And sometimes we don't even know what the exact result would be. So people rely on heuristics to process these huge data sets and get some kind of answer. And once you have a heuristic in place for any of these applications, you can now tune sort of the quality of that heuristic versus the, the number of resources that the, the application needs. So now we have this combination of systems that are highly configurable and applications that are highly configurable. And that creates this rich sort of multi-dimensional trade-off space where we can change our operating position in terms of power, the accuracy of the results and the performance or the, the timeliness that we get. So if you look at uh, the prior work that's been done, you see you can take this three-dimensional space, you can slice it in any number of uh, two-dimensional ways. Well, I guess there's six, so not any number, but six uh, two-dimensional slices. And if you look at what's, uh, at what's out there, you see there are lots of different ways to manage these things, and they tend to provide a constraint or a guarantee in one dimension and optimize in some other dimension. So for example, there are systems that will guarantee performance for real-time systems or quality of service, and, and then either uh, give you the maximum accuracy for that performance or the minimum energy. There are other systems that typically are done at the programming level, uh, programming language level. It will guarantee some kind of accuracy. So make sure that you get an acceptable result and then maximize performance or minimize energy. 
And then finally, uh, a sort of smaller category are systems that will provide some kind of energy guarantee uh, while either maximizing accuracy or um, maximizing performance. And what I, I think is interesting about the energy guarantees that are out there, they fall into to generally one of two categories. So they're sort of hard guarantees, where as soon as you hit a limit on joules, you just don't get to compute anymore. You're, you're done. Um, and then there are other systems that are trying to uh, provide a sort of soft guarantee, but they really have no formalisms. They're just based on, on heuristics. So I think this, this process of providing energy guarantees is increasingly valuable. So certainly I would like it when I'm walking around in a place I don't know, like say Monterey, and I, um, I, I am using my phone to do all kinds of stuff. I'd like my phone to last till I can get back to the charger. Right? And so, for example, I often do Skype calls with my students. I know exactly how long that call is gonna last, and I'd like to make sure that I can get the highest quality Skype call while maintaining the uh, battery for the duration of the scheduled call. Right? That's one example. Uh, but I think there are other interesting examples people might be interested in. So a search provider might want to control costs by getting the best search result that's possible in 60 millijoules. Uh, engineers might want to find the shortest wire length for a chip design in 50 kilojoules, again, to control costs. And you can imagine embedded systems designers they have a mission duration. You know, you're going to deploy some robot into the field. You know how long that uh, robot needs to be out. And you'd like to get sort of the best signal to noise ratio out of your sensor processing uh, for that mission. So that in general, all of these questions are getting at what's the best approximation that we can achieve on an energy budget? And I'd, I'd like to augment this by saying, well, what formal guarantees can we provide that will actually achieve that, that energy budget? And that's what we're gonna focus on for this talk. So I wanna go through a, a motivational example now and I'm going to take the Swish++ plus plus, uh, search engine. So this is an open source search engine that you can download and configure as a web server. I did not write it, um, but I'm very thankful for the authors for making that available. Um, and uh, back in 2011, uh, when I was a grad student, I presented some work showing how to make an approximate version of this Swish++ plus plus search engine. So I'm going to take that and run it on a system that we have in our lab which is configurable. This is just a Linux x86 system, but we can change how many cores it's using, how many, uh, what the clock speed is, how many memory controllers, these kinds of things. And if we just take that uh, search web server and we run it on the system, both in their default configuration, we get about 90 uh, millijoules per query. And for the purposes of this example, let's assume that we'd like to reduce the cost of uh, serving these queries, so we want to get 60 um, millijoules per query. So I'm going to show you four different techniques that, that we think could achieve this. Right? We could work at the system level only, just change resource usage. We could work at the application level only, just change the quality of the search. Um, or we could deploy both at the same time, uh, just take the existing approaches, run them both at the same time. That's what I call the uncoordinated approach. So uh, spoiler alert for the rest of the talk, the unconstrained approach is, or the, the uncoordinated approach is not going to work. Right? So, Sorry, <laughs> uh, but uh, what we're gonna do is then show how to actually coordinate at both application and system level and provide some formal guarantees. So if we look at the behavior of search over time, you're looking at energy on the left uh, and accuracy on the right. So energy, we're just showing joules per query and accuracy, we're showing the percentage of results returned compared to the default configuration. So that, that solid black line at uh, 90 millijoules represents the average uh, energy for the, the system in its default configuration. And it turns out if we deploy a system level approach that tunes resource usage, we can get down to 70 millijoules. So a, a significant savings, but still not at our goal of 60. Of course, we didn't lose any search results. If we use the application only approach, so the application can't directly manipulate resource usage in this example. So what it has to do is process the queries as fast as possible and get to an idle state. And then uh, it goes through these cycles of processing really fast and then idling to reduce energy down to the, the target of 60 millijoules. So we can actually meet the energy goal now, but we did so by sacrificing a huge number of results from our search query, which you can see on the, on the right uh, there. So 
if we, if we pause here and think about it, it looks like the system only approach significantly reduced energy by itself. And then the application only approach was able to get an additional speed up uh, or additional energy savings. So why not just run them both at the same time? It turns out we can do that. We can have both trying to improve energy at the same time and we get bad behavior. So instead of nice predictable energy, which we would like, we now have oscillating energy where we go through periods of very high and, uh, and then very low energy consumption. So this is not good. If our goal is to provide some kind of guarantee about energy consumption, this clearly fails. And what we're going to do is build a system uh, called JewelGuard here, which coordinates both application and system, and actually meet the goal of 60 millijoules, and does so while sacrificing just a small number of search results. Right, so now the average number of results returned is about 81%. Uh, so we can't get the full, the full number of search results. That's just not possible in that energy budget. But this is, turns out to be very close to the optimal number of results to return for that particular energy budget. So now I'd like to tell you a little bit about how JewelGuard actually works. Uh, so let's uh, make sure we're all on the same page about energy consumption. So I have energy here represented by the, the Monster Energy Drink, which is an unofficial sponsor of my research. Um, in fact, if there's a representative of Monster in the audience, I'd be happy to talk about actual sponsorship opportunities. Um, so energy, of course, is, is equal to power consumption uh, multiplied by time. So if we want to change, uh, change these things, the system level is actually able to, to manipulate both power and time. That right away becomes complicated because we're looking at a, a nonlinear problem. We can change both of those at the same time. At the application level, we're really only able to change time. We can sort of change how, uh, how much work we have to do, the timeliness. And now somehow we need to coordinate both of these things, right? So we have things happening at both levels. So I wanted to draw an analogy. It turns out we're just around the corner from a famous racetrack, the Laguna Seca racetrack. Um, and so if you were going to race on a track, you'd take your car or your motorcycle and you'd tune it for the track. So Laguna Seca is famous for that turn uh, there. You can see in the, the lower left of the racetrack picture. So that's, if you're going to bring a, a car here to race, you'd want to tune your car to make sure that you could handle that turn. So get through it as fast as possible while still maintaining uh, safety, right? So that's already a difficult problem. And that's kind of analogous to the problem of adapting at either the system or the application level, right? So in either case, we're assuming something's fixed. The system assumes the application is essentially fixed and is going to adapt its resource usage. The application assumes the system is essentially fixed and adapts its behavior. But that's not what we're trying to do now. Uh, so instead of having a fixed racetrack that we know ahead of time, we're actually going to allow the racetrack to be modified, right? So like the, the kinds of things I used to play with when I was a kid, you can build your own racetrack and you can modify the car. And you can actually do both of these at the same time now, right? So this is, this is a difficult problem. And this is exactly why we saw the bad behavior uh, in the earlier example slide. Both application and system were changing at the same time, and they were changing too fast for each other. So we got into these oscillating scenarios. So I'd like to avoid it. So our goal here, again, is to provide energy guarantees um, with some formalisms. So we take some measure of the amount of work that we have to do in an energy budget, that gets turned into an energy efficiency goal, which gets put into JewelGuard. It then breaks the problem of meeting this energy efficiency goal into two stages. One is system energy optimization, and the second is application accuracy optimization. These two boxes spit out configurations of the system and application, and then they collect feedback to see how well they're doing and change their behavior. So specifically, the system level approach is using bandit-based learning techniques to find the most energy efficient uh, system level trade-off. So it's trying to navigate this performance and energy curve. It's going to take its result and send some information to the application level approach, which is going to use a control system to navigate the performance and accuracy trade-off. And the key insight here is that we're going to do this communication, so the system level is going to actually tell the application a little bit of information about what it's doing. And it turns out that it's just a small amount of information uh, that you need, and we'll look at exactly what that is. 
But to, to make it clear what needs to be exchanged here, we need more detail on both the system level and application level. So bandit-based learning is a technique based on um, the multi-armed bandit problem. So you walk into a casino, there are a bunch of slot machines. You'd like to find the slot machine with the highest payoff and then keep playing that highest payoff machine. The problem is difficult because you have to search this space, right? So you have to balance searching for a better payoff with exploiting the best payoff that you found so far. That's a classic problem in, in machine learning, right? So we're not uh, going to maximize payoff here in terms of money, but we're going to try to maximize energy efficiency. So we keep an estimate of both the performance and power consumption of every uh, state in the system. And then we need to decide whether we should move to a new state or use the best state that we've found so far. And um, so that's our current estimation. And then this is the set of equations that governs exploration versus exploitation. Now to be clear, I don't expect anybody uh, at um, this point in the morning to be able to internalize these equations. But what I do want to point out is that in balancing exploration and exploitation, the learner is naturally keeping track of its uncertainty. So uh, for now, you'll have to take this on faith, but you can read the paper and understand that this, this uh, part of the equation that I'm pointing to is actually a measure of uncertainty. So if we call that delta t, that quantifies how uncertain the learner is in its current estimates. So keep that in mind for a second. We're gonna talk about the control system. So the analogy here is cruise control in the car. I hope everybody's had experience with this. I think cruise control is a, a, a marvel of engineering right? because you set a speed and you trust that the car will operate at that speed, right? And what's amazing to me is that if you think back to high school physics, you could easily list a huge number of variables that affect the speed of the car, right? Wind speed and direction, incline, road surface, uh, you know, tire pressure, all of these things affect the speed of the car. But the cruise control is not modeling any of those things. Its model is just based on fluid flow into the engine, right? And yet, it's provably safe. We all can trust cruise control to, to operate safely. So that, that's a pretty powerful technique in that we can take a very simple model and get certain guarantees about its behavior. So I'd like to do the same thing uh, in the context of energy management. So the model turns out to be quite simple. We know what energy efficiency we're operating at as the system uh, level optimization put us into a state and we know how certain it is. So we, we need to find additional speed up to meet the energy target. We just take a look at how far we are from that speed, that gives us some error estimate. And then we use that error estimate to compute some additional speed up. Right? And now you might say, well, why do I need these fancy equations to compute speed up? Uh, you don't need them, but what's great about it is once we've put it into this model, we can formally analyze it. So the, the key insight here, again, is the learner, I said, is keeping track of this delta t term. So it knows how, uh, how uncertain it is about the model that it's learned so far. And the controller is actually, can be designed to reject uncertainty or to continue to operate safely in regions of uncertainty. So typically you would do this statically. You'd say, well, I know what my model is, I know how confident I am in the model, and you just set a poll once. But what we can do, because the learner is going to update its uncertainty constantly, is we can set the poll dynamically. Uh, so that poll, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with control systems, governs a trade-off between robustness in case of inaccurate models and responsiveness to events, to outside environmental changes. So by tuning this, what we can do is when the learner is very certain that the model is good, we make the poll small, the controller reacts very quickly to, to changes in the environment. When we're uncertain about the model, the pull is large and the controller is very uh, slow to react. So that's going to avoid the oscillations. And it turns out we can actually have formal guarantees here that we avoid the oscillations. So I, I also want to be clear about what these formal guarantees are. These are control theoretic formal guarantees, right? So it's, it's very important. Uh, of course, you have to understand the assumptions that they're based on, but it does give us a formal framework for reasoning about the dynamics of the system and its ability to actually meet the goal. So the details of this are in the paper. 
Uh, I'd like to take a, a chance now to show you some experimental results. So there, there are three things that I'd like to show you. One, that we can actually meet energy goals. Uh, two, that we can meet energy goals with near optimal accuracy, right? So I could just shut the machine off and not consume any energy, but, but that wouldn't be a very good solution. And then finally, uh, I'd like to show you that this combined approach, working at both the system and application level, is uniformly better than either system or application alone. Uh, so to experiment, I need to show you the, the actual setup. So there are three different machines that we used here. Uh, so one is an, uh, based on a mobile processor, like for your phone. It's an ARM Big Little heterogeneous architecture. Um, that was actually added based on review comments, so hopefully um, the reviewers appreciated that. Uh, it's, I think it made the paper better. I was, I was appreciative of the comment. Um, we also have a tablet based on an x86 mobile processor, and then the server that I showed you in the example. So all of these have different elements that we can configure. They're all very, they're, they're all different sets of trade-offs, right? We have one heterogeneous architecture, we have two homogeneous architectures. Some have lots of memory, some have very little memory. Um, and then we have eight different applications. Uh, these are actually made approximate by prior work, both loop perforation and uh, dynamic knobs. So there are two different ways to make approximate applications. We have three different systems. My hope is that this shows that the techniques are fairly general. And now I wanted to just give you an example of what the energy and performance, uh, or the energy efficiency trade-offs look like for these different systems. And you can tell we get really different behavior. So for all of these graphs, there are two different benchmarks. I'm just showing you for each of the systems the different configurations that are available, just in an index number, and the energy efficiency that we get. So sometimes the, the energy efficiency is really well behaved. Uh, sometimes it's not and it changes as both a function of the application and the system. So, so we do need some kind of sophistication to be able to navigate this space. All right, so the very first thing I said I wanted to show you is that we can actually meet the energy goals. Right? So we take each of these applications, each of the systems, and we run it on that system with an energy saving goal. The, there's a bar for each goal, uh, for each application and each system. And these bars range from a 1.1x energy consumption, so reducing energy consumption by 10%, to reducing energy consumption by 3x. So we're covering a wide range of possible energy savings goals. And what you can see is that we do a really good job. So, so these are soft guarantees, these aren't hard guarantees, um, because there is noise in the system, there, there's behaviors that we can't quite cancel out. And yet, we have pretty low relative error, right? So the difference between the goal that we set and the actual achieved energy consumption uh, is very small. It, in all cases, it's under 10%. The worst cases are the ones where we're pushing the limit, we're, we're telling the system to operate at the very edge of the most, the, of the achievable energy efficiency. Because if we make a mistake, we can't recover, right? So if we choose a bad configuration when we're learning and we're already at the edge of the energy efficiency goal, we don't get to recover from that. Uh, so that, that's the, the situation that causes the most, most pain. So again, I told you we could, um, we could save energy by not doing anything, but that's not going to be acceptable. So what we'd like to do is make sure that we're doing the best possible job on the energy budget. So figuring out the best possible job turned out to be a huge pain. I had to run all these configurable applications and configurable systems in a huge number of different configurations, and they change, some of these applications have phases and change behavior, so we had to look at the dynamic behavior of these things and then try to post-process that and figure out for each sampling point what configuration should we have put the application system in to maximize accuracy? We do that to create an, uh, to create an optimal, uh, a, a, an oracle system, right? This is, we can't build in practice. This is all done from post-processing data. We compare the actual achieved accuracy to the uh, oracle accuracy, and we compute the ratio. So one is perfect. Uh, we're never perfect, but we do get pretty close. And again, we see there's some places where we're off. We're off from optimal. And that occurs at the same place where we're pushing the energy efficiency as, as hard as possible. So that, that, again, if we make a mistake, we don't get to recover. Uh, so the third thing I wanted to tell you, or I wanted to convince you is that this approach that combines application and system is better than either alone. So here I took all these applications, ran them on the server with a bunch of different energy goals. Those energy goals are on the um, x-axis. And the accuracy here is shown on the y 
axis. So there are three curves for each, uh, each of these benchmarks. There's the jewel guard solid curve, there's the dash curve representing application only, and there's this dotted uh, line representing system only. So the dotted line is vertical. Uh, so the, the system always returns the same accuracy. So what that dotted vertical line shows you is the limit, how much energy efficiency you can get just by manipulating resource usage alone, okay? So then if you look at this, what you'll see two things that I think are important. By manipulating the application, we can, always, we can extend the range of possible energy efficiencies beyond what's available from the system. Right? So we always get more energy efficiency by changing the application. And then the second thing that's really important is that the blue line representing Joule Guard, the combined approach, is always better than the application-only approach. It's strictly uh, better. Right? So by, by changing both application and system at the same time, we always get a better result than just working at the application level. Uh, so one last uh, bonus result here. Because we've got uh, this control system, we can adapt to phases. Um, I, I built this sort of artificial video where I took one hard scene, I put an easy scene, and then I put the hard scene again. Right? So, uh, but the, the easy scene takes about 40% fewer resources. And what you can see here is we do maintain the energy goal. Right? So energy is basically flat modulo some noise. But when we hit the easier scene, we're able to turn that um, into increased accuracy, right? So we don't need as many resources to hit the same energy, or to hit the same uh, timing, so we can turn those resources into in increased accuracy, all for the same energy budget. So let me just wrap up here. So I, I argued that there are increasing numbers of applications that are amenable to approximation, and we're running those on configurable systems where we can change energy and performance trade-offs. While there's been a lot of work in navigating different aspects of this space, one place that was lacking was some formal guarantees for energy consumption. Uh, another issue that I showed you is that if you just take existing approaches that work at either the system or application level, they get into the oscillating behavior, uh, even if each is provably, uh, provably convergent individually. So I have one approach for combining these. It's called Joule Guard. You, you know, even if you don't like that, hopefully you do believe that combining these things is good. Right, so maybe you can come up with a better way to do the combination, but, but hopefully the combination is, uh, is what you take away as important. And then finally, I showed that this does produce better results. So I really appreciate the chance to tell you about my work, and I'd be happy to take questions. Hi, um, over here, uh, Rick Schlichting, at t Research. Um, so this is, it, 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 in the base, this is basically a um, multi-dimensional optimization problem, right? To what degree have you thought about applying mm -hmm. these techniques in other contexts? So for example, in cloud systems, you're often trying to optimize lots of different kinds of criteria. I mean, energy is one of them, but there are other ones as well. Have you thought about doing that? Yeah, um, so, you know, my, <laughs> my ambitious goal is that this would apply to any you know, multi-dimensional optimization problem as long as we got the interfaces right. And, you know, so, so if you actually look through our, our code, we tried to be very general, where you, where you specify um, what the dimensions are that are affected by any of these transformations. And I, I don't know that it'll work, but, but I have some collaborations that I, I just started with colleagues in other places to, to add resilience to, hard, to soft faults to this. And, um, to add security. That's all in very preliminary stages, so I don't yet know if it'll even work, but sure. that's the goal. Okay, thanks. Mohamed Khatib, HGST Research. So I got a question about your configurations. How do you explore the configurations and how do you basically filter out irrelevant ones? So uh, I, I heard the first part of the question was how do I explore the configurations and I did Right, that. and then how do you filter the basically irrelevant ones? How do you find what configurations that get you some savings versus others that are? Right, so, so I, I think um, you'll have to read the paper to get the, the full details, but the, the exploration versus exploitation is really balanced, is really governed by this um, uh, uh, bandit-based learning technique, right? So uh, we're assuming that the configurations are like, are like slot machines, and we'd like to find the configuration with the best payoff. So we're using existing techniques for balancing exploration versus exploitation to, to navigate that space. So do you need any insights on the application or is it completely 
input based and then output you measure energy and that's all. Oh, are you asking mechanically, like where does the code actually live? Not just mechanically, but whether you need also some insight into the application. For example, if you are talking about video, it's like several layers with the different sophistications and then oh, you need more uh, CPU frequency, okay. etc. So, so I think if I understand your, your question, it's sort of, are we exploiting correlations between different applications and, and that kind of thing? So, um, we're not currently, I think that's actually a limitation of, of the current work. So the banded-based learner is extremely inexpensive computationally, which I wanted, because uh, I don't want to consume more energy uh, trying to learn than, than I am saving by doing all of this. So we have another system that we presented at ASPLUS, which um, is, is actually computationally very expensive, but can find correlations across applications and can take information it learned about one application and apply that to another uh, application. So there's a lot of work to be done to find sort of more efficient and better learning techniques. So. Okay, thanks. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Mohamed Hogg and I'm from University of Helsinki, Finland. So uh, my question is about that you said that uh, at the same time system optimizes and also application tries to optimize so you can get the best benefit. Have you ever uh, faced such a situation that this combination can be counterintuitive or counterproductive? Uh, that it can be counterproductive. Certainly yes. that was what I was trying to show in the example, right? That um, if you don't coordinate, then you can get bad behavior. Uh, if it can be counterintuitive, um, I'm, I'm not sure I have a, a great example of that. There, there were some cases that, that surprised me. Like, uh, on, the, on the big little architecture, I expected memory bound applications to do better on the little cores. But it turned out the, the more powerful memory hierarchy on the big cores actually ran them faster. Right? So uh, that I didn't expect, but that, I'm not sure if that addresses your question. Well, uh, I, then I can share one experience and uh, probably. Okay, then we'll talk later on then. Hi, Rodrigo Fonseca from Brown. So, like the, the cruise control it, to work well, it depends on a reliable measurement of, of speed, mm -hmm. right? And so for your scheme to work well in practice in real time, you either depend on a good measurement of energy consumption or a good, really good model that is uh, based on some things you can measure in real time. Uh, but this is very hard to do, for example, in, in some mobile, mobile devices. So what, what are your views on that? How, how dependent are you on, on having accurate energy measurements in real time for this to work? Well, I, I think, yeah, so that's a great question. I mean, you need, so, so for a control system to work, you need sound feedback, uh, that's for sure. So I think that um, the, the better the energy monitors, uh, the better we'll do. But there's, there's already a lot of support in hardware. So Intel now has this Rappel monitor. It only gives you, so this might be an interesting example for your question here too. So Rappel gives you measurements of, about energy on, I believe, a millisecond basis. But it only covers the, the processor. Um, and uh, actually, I think you can get DRAM too. But it's missing the fans and the disks and stuff. So what we had to do for this example was figure out an estimate of what the static, what, what the other power that we aren't measuring is, and, um, and add that to the, the fast power measurement we got from Rappel. Uh, I unfortunately can't kind of quantify how much that affected our results, um, but it's possible we get better results with, uh, better, power, with better energy management. Thank you. Charlie Hu from Purdue. So this uh, way of decomposing your problem into these two steps, the system optimization and the uh, application optimization makes sense. So, did you mention earlier on the, you can always, by doing decomposing this way, you can always find the optimal solution, like by meeting the target energy goal? Yeah, so uh, if, uh, if I understood the question is, can this decomposition always find the optimal right. solution? So that, that's a great question. Um, so right now I only have an empirical answer, unfortunately. So. I know that from, from looking at this stuff that we did always get close to the optimal and when we weren't at the optimal, it was usually due to noise or the overhead of running our system at the same time as we're running these applications. But that, that is not yet a theoretical proof that this decomposition will always work. 
So I, I'm actually working on that, but I'm not a theorist, so I'm not sure that I'll, I'll be successful in, in proving that, but we'll Thanks. try. Thanks.